We now have two speakers speaking together, Sarah and James Mort, who together are founded and run My Haven, which is a construction company uh, based in Cairns, and it's become a social incubator, training unskilled, unemployed Indigenous and non-Indigenous people into employment in the construction industry. Um, James Mort has over 35 years of hands-on construction and property development experience. He started as an apprentice plumber and then worked his way up to high end, uh, to run a high end construction development company uh, in Victoria and now My Haven in Cairns. Um, he has, as I said, 35 years experience in the industry, providing invaluable knowledge and practical experience inspiring our indigenous and non-indigenous trainees to a new career and fulfilling future. James has qualifications in construction, training, and numerous C and literacy support. Sarah Mort, who's a director and also co-company founder with James, has been involved in the construction and property industry for 25 years, uh, commencing a career as an honours town planning graduate from Melbourne University and a postgrad in urban estate management at University of Technology in Sydney. She has a diverse career working in government, major construction and development companies in Australia and Asia, establishing her own property consultancy business before joining forces with James to establish My Haven in 2011 following the disastrous aftermath of Cyclone Yassi in far north Queensland, particularly uh, Mission Beach. And I don't know if anybody's been up to Mission Beach since Yassi, and it's not the first sort of disaster they've had in, in the last years, but um, it's it just had a, an incredible impact on that community, which they certainly haven't recovered from. Uh, with each of the speakers, I asked them to sort of give us, to give one thing, one personal thing about themselves or, or um, something they're interested in. And what I got back from Sarah and James is that they met very randomly nine years ago when they were independently on the same day went to a town planner to inquire about a property. And the town planner gave Sarah James's business card. Sarah recognised the name as someone who she thought had been to school with her brother rang up her brother in London, got some information on the guy, <laughs> and nine years later, they've got the same surname and they're running the same company. So they've combined their life passion into one package and they've been married since 2006. Please welcome James and Sarah Mort. Thanks, Annie, for that very embarrassing introduction, but anyway. <laughs> Um, Sasha, huge thank you for getting us here. We've been on the phone for about 12 months and um, today's the day to tell you our story, so we're delighted to have this opportunity. Um, yes, we were literally wiped out two years ago by Cyclone Yassi and it was the second major cyclone that James and I had lived through in five years in Mission Beach. So it was absolutely a moment of um, fight or flight for us personally to consider about packing up and going back home to S Melbourne, Sydney or seeing if there was some other way that we could actually find an opportunity in our region. We took a major leap of faith and decided as property developers that we needed to seriously change business directions because on the back of the GFC, property was literally dead in the water um, in our area. So we decided where we could best put our resources was to rebuild our community and uh, James actually came up with an incredible innovative process of procurement and logistics for building better quality cyclone rated homes. But Today, we don't really have time to go through that system, but that's really where it started. We won a government award for innovation. We actually hadn't even launched the product, so we realised we had to get moving with it. Um, bang, our door opened to uh, social enterprise. And at a time of this happening, I was in Sydney having coffee, and I caught up with a friend of mine at Macquarie Bank, and he said to me, Sarah, you're not thinking big enough. And I thought, well, how big can we go? Within six months, we were... Um, Given the opportunity, and I'm going to say a huge thank you here to, to the former DWA through the Flexible Funding Pool, a, a whole world that I didn't know about as a property developer. I'd never in my life had relied on any grant money or, or funding. And uh, we were engaged in building four projects for the community. And the net result of that, to be involved in that funding, was that we actually had to train 30 unemployed, disadvantaged Indigenous people. So that was our challenge and we realised it was something we hadn't come from before but we realised there was a need for it and we felt that we, maybe we were equipped to actually take on the, um, the, the course. And that was the turning point of our life changing. 
within 18 months, and this is only, I'm talking literally 24, you know, two years ago, uh, we then grew from three staff to 15 full time and we relocated our office from Cairns, from Mission Beach to the big smoke of Cairns. Um, remember at the time too, up in um, North Queensland and very much um, same sort of happening down here in your region was we're in the middle of the biggest major economic crisis that our region had ever seen. Uh, we had massive unemployment, uh, tourism was absolutely decimated and uh, the building industry had absolutely gone in our region. Uh, so what on earth were we doing setting up a construction company? Um, we realised though that there were new challenges for us to juggle and uh, we certainly did not know anything about acronyms such as JSA, RTO and uh, government departments like DWA but suddenly they became our friends and we suddenly realised this problem was pretty big. Now I've got to use this. This slide, um, some of you people will be familiar with the statistics and I'm not going to go into too much detail, but this just shows that, especially in regional Australia, that, non, that Indigenous males is five times higher than non-Indigenous males and that just is just a small indication about how big the problem is and then the associated costs with that problem. So our approach to this problem, coming from a construction background, was to be very practical and uh, very much about just go out and do it. Um, and let the policy writers catch up with, with what we're up to. Uh, we took this approach and developed a pilot program with an Indigenous community up in Cape York called Napranam. And we managed to get five houses built uh, within about six months this year. And James managed to train 15 men in that community and they are now working full time for the council. So it's Paul Kelly's song goes, from little things, big things grow, and that's our day-to-day -day mantra. Today, James and I are going to tell you about how we've developed this industry-based pre-employment training model and how we've become social changers. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Well done. Uh, look, the training model we've embarked on is a real-life training model. We take the students, trainees, participants, cohorts, whatever you like to call them, into a real life experience. We take them from the classroom into our, one of our construction sites, from our construction site into our warehouse, from our warehouse back to the classroom, so on, so forth and so on. They're very visual learners, these guys, so they get it. When, when they see it, they often say to me, James, that's that crap you were telling me last, yesterday in the, uh, in the classroom and when they're on site and, and uh, when they're on site they say that's the crap we learned last week. So it's fantastic that they really get it and, and um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite honouring for them when they do get it. We're faced with very big employment barriers. Um, the JSAs feed us stream three and four guys. And uh, you know, stream three and four. Everybody loves pigeonholing people. I hate pigeonholing people. These guys have barriers, so we work on those barriers. Um, you know, they once they get it and their lights turn on, it it, it is a fantastic feeling. It really is. Um, so they enjoy turning up. Their their real personalities start to come out and. They, uh, they enjoy doing things that make them smile. They turn up every day because they're looking forward to the next exciting phase we put them through into their lives. It's, uh, it's great for them. Part of this deal is we rely heavily on literacy, numeracy and communication skills. We have found, especially with Indigenous guys, that this is their major barrier. And it's not only just a barrier for them, that they can't communicate. The biggest barrier for them is the shame and embarrassment they have about not being able to communicate. And uh, that's a big one. So, so we, we talk to them um, and we, we use literacy, numeracy and, um, and communication skills we teach them. And you know that, that embarrassment holds them back. It holds them back from their potential. Um, 
so that's what we do. Uh, look, our model is based, spans six months and beyond. We deliver accredited training. Um, we deliver construction, civil construction, warehouse, logistics, and retail. We do that because it's a multi-skilled area over the six months. There's Certificate 2 courses. All it is is a taste for them. It's a taste over the six months. And then during that six months, and here comes the really cool bit that I love, we take the group out. We take them on field trips. We take them to see a fantastic Aboriginal man, Brian Gray, who started a boxing gym. He's a boxer. He's part of the Stolen Generation. He's a wonderful man. He started a gym called Natural Born Fighters in Cairns. And he teaches them about the discipline in sport and how that discipline can transcend into their life. And they get it. Once again, visual, boxing, exercise, fabulous. We take them to a wonderful in Indigenous girl in Cairns who started an Indigenous cafe in Cairns. And she talks to them about healthy eating, um, proper eating, and how that transcends into their life. These two people reach down and touch their hearts, and that makes them smile. You can't wipe the smile off their face. And once that starts happening, that's the tipping point. We've got them. They start loving it, and they really do love it. Um, the model places the utmost importance on the mentor, the right mentor. And the mentor that we use in the program aren't just taxi drivers, which is often the case. They, they, part, they, they form part of the group over the six months. And they listen to these guys. They talk to these guys. They take them hiking. They take them fishing. Whatever it takes to break down those barriers that they've got. So uh, the mentors, very, very important. We're not saying we can fix all the problems. Some of the problems that these guys have, the barriers, are deep-seated. Some of the alcohol and drug issues are beyond our expertise. But we're there to identify those problems and assist and, and feed them into more professional help. In the midst, midst of all this going around, our wonderful industry liaison manager, Robbie Goulding, is out talking to industry, organising uh, job placements, job experience, work experience for these guys. Remember, we are industry talking to industry. We're a construction company, so we talk to our suppliers. It's sort of a two-way street. We use your stuff, but you help us. It works. So during that six-month period, as I said, they have this multi-streamed education experience in Cert 2. So they make a choice after six months. So after six months, we say, what do you guys want to do? Do you want to go into a warehouse? Do you want to learn logistics? Do you want to learn civil construction? Do you want to get into to, uh, construction and apprenticeship? Do you want to go into retail? And we teach retail because everybody needs a bit of front about them, a bit of, um, well, upfront about them and how to communicate with people. So that, that helps them with that. We've pre-committed places uh, with, with our suppliers and our contacts in Cairns. So, you know, Sarah and Robbie went out last week and they got 30 places. We will get your guys to come in to do work experience and if they meet certain criteria, we'll give them a job. I mean, that's fantastic. Everybody in Cairns is jumping on board with us. It's wonderful. Um, We, once, once we've got these placements and Robbie, the, Robbie's job then is to make a fit with our trainees and the employer. And that's important because you just don't throw them into a, a job that firstly they don't want to be in and secondly they don't get on with the employer. It's, it's, a, it's doomed failure. So Robbie makes a fit. And once the fit is made, our field officers stay between the employer and the trainee or the employee for 12 months to keep
keep that line of communication open because it's so important. We've seen it so many times that a little, a little miscommunication blows up into something huge. We had a, a, a case where, you know, you know, one of our guys just walked. He didn't, because he didn't know how to communicate, so he walked. So we've put in place this 12-month field officer idea to stay between them, and it's a constant. Look, all this stuff is great, um, but until we can reach into the hearts of those guys and touch them, uh, it's all for nil. These guys, they all have a story. They, they have disadvantages. They didn't go to a private school. They didn't, you know, they've come up in the hard knocks. But they, ha well, they all have stories, and we listen to their stories. We tell them about about their stories in their life. We, we, we help them put all their problems and their woes in context with their stories. And that's very important. Because everybody's got a story and we listen to them. And, that, and that's fun. We share this passion that we've got with our employers and they join us because they enjoy continuing our work. We do the hard yard for six months over to them, but we stay with them. And that's, that's the really good bit. So what have we got? <clears throat> what we've got is a tripartite social change happening. We've got three groups reliant upon each other to change. That's fantastic. And it's going boom. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, James. He's certainly got a lot of passion for it, as you can tell. Um, as James was saying, and what I was going to wrap up with was the outcomes. So everybody that walks in our door who is unemployed wants a job. So that's our key focus. That's our number one challenge. Um, once we've got them a job, the program we're now working on, which is getting the support mechanisms for the employer and the employee, because we can't do everything. We don't, have, we don't have the funding. We don't have the time. But for another company to want to buy into the program, we need to say to them that you're not going to be just left out there on your own. Everyone knows, if you've run a business, how hard it is to employ people. Um, and especially if you're employing disadvantaged people, you really need some support around that. So I think that's key for the future. Um, we're just flying through some slides that we missed out on. But I want to come up to the slide about partnerships. So this is really important, and it sort of relates a bit more with what Les was saying about we need long-term relationships. We can't do this in a short time frame. Napronum, which is up near Weepa in Cape York, we've had a unique opportunity to partner with that community for four years. So we are now training and developing all their housing directly with that community. And we started last year with seven of My Haven's construction team in the community building. This year we start with one. So we've already reduced seven down to one of my Haven staff on the ground. And we've got 70% of the community on the build on every single house that we're building. And our goal is at the end of four years, which I'm sure we'll wrap up earlier, is that we have zero of my Haven people on the ground and it's completely the Napronum community building their houses. Um, talked about jobs, James touched on the relationship that we've been developing um, very much with, um, with our support partners. The more our construction company, this is sort of the cool part of social enterprise, we are a for-profit business and therefore we've got to really make this business work, we've got to pay wages every day. We face the same issues that all businesses face in Australia, cash flow, competition, the day in, day out hassle factors of running a business. Um, we relate to that story, that's our story. Uh, we've got to be good at what we do in building and we've got to be good at what we do with training. So uh, we have a lot of pressure on us, but we, we enjoy that, that challenge. Um, up until a week ago, we weren't even an RTO. That word I didn't know a year ago, I now know. So we will be bringing that into our business next year. Primarily because we're industry and we do believe that some of our skill base of teaching is of a very high calibre because we're coming off the ground and as James touched on, 70% of what we teach is on the ground, on the job. So we treat every person that joins the program as though they are working with us the day they walk into the door. So they, they are developed to be work fit, so they are really ready to go out and work for somebody else. 
that's important to us because we're actually referring those people to our supplier partners. So we're asking them, you know, if our business grows and we keep buying more windows from you or more bricks or more whatever we buy, uh, surely there's an opportunity that you could take another person into your workforce. So the job I've been on in the last week, which was great to get out of the office, was to talk one-on-one -on -one to our supplier partners. And I was just absolutely astounded that no one said no. And in 90% of the cases, I got yes twice, which meant I walked out the door with two employment outcomes in six months' time from companies in Cairns, which were literally 18 months ago on their knees. Um, we have some really good green shoots happening in our community, in our region, with construction, with some major tourism development. Um, and I think, finally, everyone in Cairns is saying we need to get workforce capacity ready, and this is a good program to work within. The really good things about helping someone get out of an unemployment and with Indigenous people, very much generational unemployment, we've calculated that on a per head basis that you're looking at a saving of around $2 million per person if they can stay out of unemployment and stay in employment in their lifetime. That's a pretty big figure. You know, there's other issues, and I mean, there's other benefits we all know. There's reduced suicide rates, especially in communities, overcrowding and social housing, and hopefully one day the need for no more social housing, that they can afford their first home. One of those photos you saw in Hope Vale, we actually built the first home for an Indigenous woman called Cheryl Cannon on freehold land in Hope Vale. That's the first freehold home owned in Cape York so far, and that was three months ago. So there are changes. Just summing up to today, um, you know, I think the most important thing to give everybody is hope, to let, get everybody to believe that there is a future for them. And um, I wanted to summarise, James, are you ticking? I need that last slide. <laughs> <laughs> that's the graduation, that's uh, celebrating everyone getting a job, that's Emily and Peter who are now working for a landscaping business in Cairns, that's a bunch of the guys of... Um, companies in Cairns that have employed these, this, the recent group we've had. Uh, their businesses are growing as well. So this is what I want to say. Um, there's no situation that's not transformable. There's no person who's hopeless. There's no set of cir circumstances that cannot be turned about by human beings and their natural capacity for love of the deepest sort. Thanks very much. <laughs> there is a three-minute film if they want it. There is a three-minute film of the last group we trained working out with Brian Gray boxing, if you want to see it. But if time's... You want to see it? OK, shoot. <laughs> we give them an introduction to the building industry, you know, how to use tools, how to plan uh, work, how to read plans, fairly basic building industry so that they can go into to a builder and, and learn more. Boxing is a, is, a, is a sport about technique and skill and it also gives you life skills like determination, you know, uh, a winning attitude, you know, and, and, and never give up attitude and build self-confidence self and self-esteem. These attributes you can take into your workplace, and when, you know, you can, they're transferable things. Things you learn here like the disciplines of boxing, the mental toughness of it and all that stuff, you can apply those things in everyday life. For me, it's I'm loving every moment of it. I, the fact that I want to become a landscaper and being out putting um, myself out to, you know, get there, considering where I have been, Robbie's probably the one person that has put me up to, you know, where I want to get because I was stuck in a rut for a good while. So, yeah, it's work and wonders, definitely. People that bring out the best in you. See, see, when you're in an environment like this. Where, where you're, you're in a accountable environment, you're in a structured training program, you have people in there that actually can help you to bring the best out of you and, and bring that potential out of you that, that's, that's in there and encourage you to, to grow in your fitness and, and be motivated and continue on and, and, and make it a long-term thing instead of a one-month hit thing and then give up. I believe in the program and it's, it's really good to see uh, my haven doing this sort of thing rather than, I mean a lot of building companies do transportable housing and just send tradesmen to build them. Well, my haven are sending only a couple of tradesmen and using the local people, which is really, really good. That, that, that's a good model. It was good to speak into them, you know, and, and maybe plant some good ideas with them and inspire them to keep going and stay focused and motivated and reach their goals and live their dreams, really. So, um, to see young people like that who are starting off in their their journey and, and just beginning, they probably need all the help they can, so I'm just glad I could con contribute to them in some way, you know, and 
give them some good advice. It'll definitely help me in the long run with um, my performance at work and I, I was down for a long time so to, to get back into the workforce is, is quite difficult. It's a good scheme that My Haven have got and they've got some good dedicated people doing it too. I want to start my own business in the long run anyway so his, his speech has helped me to pursue that. I, I double thought it, thought about not bothering but no it's definitely something I want to do. That was such an inspiring presentation, and um, but I'm really interested in your own journey. I, I mean, it's obvious that you're passionate about the project, but just about your own experience prior to this project in working with Indigenous people, and what you had to do to, um, on your own journey to um, become more culturally confident, and also just any advice you'd have on what you would tell employers who might be looking at employing Indigenous people who haven't had that experience. We, we stepped into this arena green, very green. I'm from Melbourne, Sarah's from Melbourne. I went to private school, Sarah went to private school. I didn't see my first Aboriginal bloke until I was about 30. I mean, I didn't know what I was getting into. <clears throat> but what I knew is that I had a lot up here to share. And I found over the years where I was, you know, in my construction company, I had apprentices all through. For some reason, I can, I can help them, I can teach them. And young white fellas know the difference from young black fellas. But going into the community was, a, was an eye-opening for us. And, and I asked our, our Aboriginal guy once, you know, what do I do? What would the cultural difference help me? He said, look, just simplify. Just normalise it. They're, they're no different. They want to live. They want to get a job. They want to move on and get a job. Just normalise it. And that's what we're doing with the housing up there. We're, we're normalising the housing. We're not... We're cutting down that thing of block walls and little windows, no cross ventilation and all that sort of stuff. We're designing quite beautiful homes that the Premier we just saw in the, in the photo come up from Apple and said, God, these, these houses that you're building, they fit into the best suburbs in Brisbane, let alone average community. So normalise, I, I guess. I suppose from my background is I've had such a ranged career from working with major Asian development companies, dealing at Sydney Council where you were, Helen. Um, I think you get equipped about just not taking no as an answer and um, with this government situation after the cyclone, we just got a random call and we never say no. So someone said, come to this meeting and talk to about this program about the flexible funding pool. So we got out of the car in Cairns that day and James said, this will probably be a complete waste of time or it may change our lives. So <laughs> We just went in there and said, we'll do it. Thanks, I'll be quick. Housing and homelessness and um, opportunities for young people are probably the biggest issues I can think of in the Northern Rivers. So um, I've got a spare room and there's a shed at my house. Anytime you'd like to come and start business here, fine. We're good to go. We would love to start business here. <laughs> we, we never say no. 